This week on Quadriga, war in Syria, no peace without Putin. The war in Syria has killed a quarter of a million people. Millions have been displaced, fleeing IS terror. Even more are trying to escape bombing by government forces. Russian President Vladimir Putin is now upping military support for Bashar al-Assad. Putin is keen to promote himself in the West as an indispensable partner in the fight against terror. What are his real motives? Does the West have no choice but to work with the Russian president if Syria is to have any chance of peace? Coming to you from Berlin, Quadriga, the international debate. Your host this week, Peter Craven. Yes, hello and a very warm welcome indeed to this latest edition of Quadriga coming to you from the heart of the German capital, Berlin. And the question we're discussing this week is war in Syria, no peace without Putin, without Vladimir Putin, question mark. And to discuss that question, it's a tough question to discuss. I'm joined here in the studio by three seasoned analysts. Let me introduce them to you, beginning with Alan Posnam. The Anglo-German writer and journalist is a regular commentator for the Berlin-based daily Die Welt. And he says Putin supports Assad and Tehran, two regimes that are much more dangerous than the Islamic State. Putin is part of the problem, not the solution. Also with us today, Ivan Rodionov, the editor-in-chief of Russia Today, the German version, who's reported extensively from conflict zones such as Chechnya, Afghanistan and the Middle East. And he says the Western regime change operation in Syria has failed miserably. Time to face the facts, he says, and deal with the consequences. And welcome to Ines Paul, who is, as they say, currently between jobs. Until recently, she was editor-in-chief of another of the Berlin dailies, the Tageszeitung, or TATS. Soon, she'll be a Deutsche Welle correspondent in Washington. And Ines Paul argues that the West has let a murderous Assad rampage for so long that now there's no option but to turn to Putin. The first question for uh, Ivan Rodionov. Uh, Ivan, as we've seen, Syria is... Uh, seeing Russian forces, the presence of Russian forces being stepped up in the west of the country. What's it all about? What is Russia up to? The Russian interest is obviously to, um, in steps, curb the current violence, stop the war, which is uh, frequently labelled as a civil war, but which it, in fact, uh, not quite is, and to stabilise, ultimately, uh, the country and the region. That's uh, what the... Russian aims in Syria are. It's got nothing to do with geostrategic ambitions. Well, of course, every country pursues uh, its interests. And uh, uh, it's, it's a matter of um, uh, where those interests are. The Russian interest is definitely in stabilizing the country. And if you look at the facts, if you look at the situation on the ground, uh, there is... At the moment, uh, as I see it, only one force that can really stabilize and consolidate Syria, that is the current government uh, and uh, the President Assad, who, who has a more than 10 million vote of the Syrian population. The only force that can consolidate Syria is Bashar al-Assad and his government, Alan. I mean, that is... Um turning facts on the head, which we are used to from uh, representatives of Russian state media. Um, the fact is that Syria has been destabilized by Mr. Bashar al-Assad. He went on a murderous rampage against, at first, a peaceful opposition in his country. He used barrel bombs, chemical weapons on his own people, supplied by the Russians who want nothing more than stability in this, in this area. He himself created almost single-handedly Islamic State by letting Islamists out of the prison to create the idea of a war against terror, which he could then use, as he is now doing, together with his, uh, uh, with his Russian backers, who are basically interested in keeping their military base in Tarsus and Latakia and uh, nothing... And in, propping up a regime which is blood dripping from its fingers. I mean, it's incredible that, that facts should be turned on the head in this way. I'm, 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 I'm And don't shocked. forget, Putin is also chasing refugees to Europe now. Yeah, absolutely, right? it's yeah. doing that too, yes. But that was the case against Bashar al-Assad. What is the case for Bashar al-Assad? The case for Bashar al-Assad mm -hmm. is, uh, as, as I said, that popular vote of 10 million Syrians 
uh, in the country and abroad also. When you talk about the How popular vote, we know we're talking, we're talking about the, you presumably about the referendum in 2000, the referendum 2007. I'm talking presidential would, elections 2014 with 88% uh, Described of, by most observers as a farce, as a fiasco. Okay. You know that, this that, well. That, then here we are at the point where you're talking of interest. Of course, mm. if the outcome of a certain elections does not fit into the picture, then those elections are labelled and and, and uh, called uh, farce and, 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 and stuff. Mm. Uh, of course, if, if someone as Bashar al-Assad, against whom the United States had a strategy of toppling him already in 2006, which... Uh, uh, leaked uh, depeches of the then U.S. ambassador in Damascus show clearly when uh, he was uh, um, cabling to then uh, U.S. Uh, State Department led by Condoleezza Rice saying that... Is Bashar no, al-Assad a good guy? He is a... Well, I don't think that the question is worded in a correct way. He is a president that has a backing of his own population. And uh, um, he is, well, he has, a leader the backing on whom... Of a, well, yeah, yes. yeah and, and, well, I think there is no doubt, excuse me, but that Bashar al-Assad is not a good guy. He's killing his people. He's killing six, at least six times as many people as the IS does. But the question is, do we need Putin to fight IS, to fight Assad maybe on the long run, and to stabilize the country and to prevent more refugees coming to Germany and Europe? I mean, this is the biggest question behind it. For me, there's no doubt that Assad is a mass murderer. And I think we shouldn't discuss that, otherwise I feel that I have to leave this place. I mean, there is no doubt, there's so much evidence in this world. But do we need Putin? And which interests, that was your first question, I would like to come back to that. Which interests could we have to bond with Putin? In which way do we need him maybe to stabilize Syria? And I think we do need him. I think, uh, sure, Vladimir Putin has <laughs> very many geostrategical strategic interests. He wants to come back to the, you know, to the world. He wants to prove that he's important. The West has failed to fight uh, Assad earlier on, and now we need Putin, as we might need Erdogan as well. Do we like these people? No, but can we do that without them? Them, I think we do rely on them to a certain point. Well, uh, if you look beyond those ideological mantras that you just go on spreading about Putin I'm and talking Assad, about facts. Then, uh, and you, if you face the facts, that's uh, uh, okay. Even if you, uh, it's, it's a highly arguable um, thing to say that, that it was Bashar al-Assad who killed all those who died in this terrible, terrible conflict and who's to blame for. But even given that, well, look at, at uh, say, George Bush, who's responsible for one million Iraqi lives. Uh, would you describe him as a war criminal who now spends his uh, um, comfortable life uh, on his ranch uh, uh, painting pictures, uh, while if you apply same standards, he belongs to The Hague in front of the International Tribunal? Uh, the fact of the matter is, Ivan Rodionov, that uh, the, the, the people in The Hague at the International Criminal Court, they do want to see uh, Bashar al-Assad and the only reason he hasn't appeared in front of the court, or at least be, come come, un, come under prosecution from the court, is that he's been he's been defended by Russia and other allies. Why? Uh, why just don't you let the Syrian population, the Syrian people, decide who is to lead their country? Why, uh, of, even if you describe that presidential election, I mean, the question as, is how many members of the population that you're describing are in prison as as political prisoners? Do you have numbers? Uh, but people the, the are leaving the numbers this are certainly, It's very when, difficult to take account, but the numbers are certainly the country, high. The numbers certainly run into the tens of the thousands by torn, most authoritative torn up sources. By, by, this, by this terrible conflict, which, again, is uh, described uh, as a civil war, which it, in fact, it is, which it, in fact, is not. Because this, this war, this conflict, is uh, fueled by external foreign intervention, as we know, for which we have multiple overwhelming evidence for the US meddling there, for the Saudis, for, well, leaving alone Turkey, uh, across the uh, sending all those uh, um, fighters and uh, weapons across the border. Uh, we have now this uh, US strategy of uh, building up this new Syrian force of 15,000 fighters with 500 million, so on top of my head, 500 million dollars spent on it or to be spent that brought out 54 individuals. Isn't that an indication of uh, 
uh, what actually the Syrian population and what, what the situation in Syria shows, that 54 individuals, that's 10 million bucks per capita, that's arguably the most expensive training program ever in the world, 54 fighters were picked out, handpicked, <clears throat> and uh, uh, trained, equipped to fight uh, against the IS and against Assad, of whom only nine are now on the battlefield and still have uh, uh, still have uh, a line of communication to Pentagon, and uh, uh, the rest, other change sites, just disappeared. Alan, yeah, you're talking about outside intervention, and you just refuse to mention the fact that the main backer, the main supplier of weapons for Assad has been Russia, has been Mr. Putin's but Russia. Without, Russian, without Russian help, he wouldn't have been able president. to build up an arsenal of chemical weapons. He wouldn't have been able to, to bomb his own people with planes supplied by, by Russia. This is the, what I'm saying when I say Russia is part of the problem. The question is, should Russia, as part of the problem, be brought in yes. to be part of the solution? You can argue that. But my question is just, how important is Mr. Assad? He controls 15% of uh, his own country. He's in a very tight spot. His own people, his own Alevite allies are turning against him. But and in this situation, I think actually Russia is very badly equipped to help Mr. Assad. You are going to get such a beating by Hezbollah and other people that I wouldn't like to be in the, so in the shoes of a Russian soldier at this moment. But um, this, is a very interesting, out, this is a very interesting point. Um, I always like it when one talks about international politics to really not talk about moral, just to talk about facts and interests. Right. So what is the interest of Vladimir Putin? He wants to prove he's a big player in the world. I mean, we all do agree at a certain point he wants to prove that. He goes only so long with Saddam, uh, with, with Bashar al-Assad as long as he's good for him, you know. So maybe he just supports him up to a certain point and then he changes like his plan. So we, I think we have to see how can Putin help really to bring back peace and to stop the mass murdering which is going on day by day in this very minute people get killed in Syria and how can help Putin stopping that and he might you know he's because he wants to prove I'm back on the world stage okay and this is how we should think okay. I think one more sentence from Ivan Rodionov and then no, we'll have a look at some pictures sorry, and take a break. That's a Freudian slip of the tongue uh, uh, when you mix up Assad and, and uh, Saddam. Uh, um, Sorry, uh, don't want to actually pick on you, but that's really indicative. How many people die okay. under the well, bombs was, dropped was, by the US it, it airplanes? Was one, Ivan Rodolfo, many... let's just wait a second. Let's have a look at some pictures and we'll come back. I'm, I'm sure the conflict... <laughs> The, the conflict that we're talking about is a very, very complex conflict. It's, it's triggered a conflict here already in the studio. Let's just have a look at some pictures that try and, and, and try and explain at least, an attempt to explain uh, what it's all about. It's a complex game with global consequences. Bashar al-Assad is clinging stubbornly to power. With barrel bombs, he's conducting a bitter war of attrition at the expense of the Syrian people. His most important allies are Russian President Vladimir Putin and Iran. His opponents, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the West, led by the U.S. Both are trying to checkmate the Syrian leader, but in different ways. On the ground, Western countries are supplying and supporting Peshmerga units, but their ally Turkey is also fighting the Kurdish militias. Assad depends on his Alawites and on forces provided by Hezbollah head Hassan Nasrallah. But the paramilitary group hates the Israelis, which is why the Israelis are talking to the Russians. Then there are the other participants in the conflict, Sunni jihadist militias like IS and the al-Nusra Front. They've played bigger and bigger roles with financial help from supporters in some of the Gulf states, which, however, are also U.S. allies in the region. In a deadly match that's this entangled, is there any way to win? Ivan Rodionov, uh, the, the, the question there is, in this great game, as it's being depicted, a chess game almost, is there any way to win? The one thing we do know is that Vladimir Putin doesn't like to be a loser. He's going to be mapping out his strategy at the United Nations General Assembly next week. What is he likely to say? What I started with, that the 
the Russian interest and the Russian strategy in Syria is to stabilize the situation in the following steps first, curb the violence. Uh, of course, it is essential also to stop this influx of weapons and, and fighters across the Turkish border. Uh, and uh, I think that for those who cannot afford this luxury of being so ideologically stubborn, the uh, idea dawns on them, on the politicians, that, uh, OK, even if we don't like uh, Assad, but if we do our profit-loss calculation, then uh, we arrive at the conclusion that uh, toppling Assad uh, at least should not be put back as a priority for the US, the, 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 the Great Britain and, and, uh, and company, uh, because uh, right now, Toppling Assad means, of course, slaughter of the Elevites, slaughter of the minorities, pogroms against the Christians, pogroms against the LGBT community, who, of course, depends on the protection of this very circular, okay. most circular government in the whole region, yep. with two women, uh, by the way, uh, represented in the cabinet. What do you make of all that? You were pleading for realpolitik just a, just a couple of minutes ago. Do you, can you see a way, can you see a common cause between the West and this vision? Um, I think, it, after all, it shouldn't be the decision of the West if um, Assad will stay in the country or not. This is the, to the Syrian people. You know, they have, by the end of the day, to make the decision whom they want to be ruled by, uh, how they handle their different uh, opposition groups and so on. At this very point, we, we, the West, have to do everything to stop the daily killing uh, and again, therefore, we do need Putin, I think, as he's now willing to step in, as he's now willing to um, step in with military forces, which the West didn't do, even so the red line was crossed uh, with the chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is my realpolitik, what I kind of pledge for. Mm -hmm. What do you say, Alan? Well, I would disagree, because you have to ask yourself, why is Putin coming with weapons now? Why has he got 24 fighter aircraft situated in, in, in Latakia? Why is he building houses for hundreds of soldiers? I think what he's doing is going to prop up the Assad regime, which is having, which is, which I I agree is not um, going to be toppled by the ragtag uh, terrorists and so-called freedom fighters supported by the Arab Gulf states, but will be toppled quite possibly by, or would have been if, if, if Russia wouldn't have intervened, by his own people who see that they're the the place they control has has gone down to 15% of the country and want to get rid of him. And now he's been, he's, he's been, uh, he's had his, his, his back stiffened by Mr. Putin, which is terrible because there was a possibility of, of reaching agreement with the other members of his, of, of the Alawite uh, ruling clique. And now uh, that has faded into the background. Probably we can't do anything else except negotiate with Mr. Putin. Uh, he's been very clever, but uh, it's not good for Syria. But, Ellen, I disagree at one point. Why now? Because he sees a gap that the West is so weak, weak and weaker. That's true. And that Germany, Europe is under such a high pressure because of all the refugees coming. And he's just taking this chance because we will not look at Ukraine and the conflict there so closely anymore because now it's all about Syria in this hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. sitting in camps, mm -hmm. being on their way to, mm -hmm. to Germany and Europe. So, um, and this is the chance Putin takes. You can say it's just a clever politician. I think he knows that Assad, Assad is weakened. I think he's not able and willing to stabilize him in the long run. But he takes this in the chance in this very moment. Mm -hmm. There has been talk of a transitional solution to all this, where Assad would there would be a be behind the scenes agreement that uh, that Assad would be allowed to stay in power for another six months and then his departure would be engineered. Is that what we're really looking at here? That somehow the Russians and the, Amer uh, and the Americans coming together and making an agreement behind the scenes to remove this authoritarian leader, deal with Islamic State perhaps, and maybe, possibly resolve some of the suffering of the Syrian people? Well, there is no way a um, president, a ruler, can hold out for four years in this uh, um, highly fueled from, from outside war if he does not enjoy the popular backing in his own country. No foreign country, no weapon supplies can uh, prop up a what you call regime or government uh, to be more neutral uh, in this position 
if not that backing of the population that fights tooth and nail for their own lives. You're saying okay, whoever's wait, wait, in power is in power because, because they enjoy your populism okay, so let's hear it, because we're, otherwise we're going to run out of time. That would be a pity. I'd love to believe that we can reach an agreement here um, and that Assad is actually representative of the people who should be part of an agreement and so on. We're going to stabilize Syria together with Russia. But the whole point is that everything Russia has done, whether it be in Syria, whether it be in Ukraine, whether it be in Georgia, whether it be in Moldavia, has been to destabilize situations. That's what Russia does. That's what Mr. Putin does. He has no positive vision for any part of the world. And We've seen that on the one hand, Mr. Assad is supported by Hezbollah, and by the other hand, is supported by Iran. Two sworn enemies of Israel, a state which is very near to our heart and very near to our uh, uh, German uh, state interest in, in security. Now, why on earth should we now suddenly believe that Mr. Putin is going to be uh, a part of a, of a positive solution for, for Syria? OK. Well, We've had for and against there in terms of the in terms of the Putin vision. I just want to talk a little bit about the whole issue of intervention because interventions one of one of the lessons of recent history uh, has been that interventions often lead to more chaos and more violence. Let's have a look at some pictures on that. The Russian president is increasing his country's active military involvement in Syria. His goal is to help his long-standing ally Bashar al-Assad. Western analysts are already speculating that soon Russian military aid will include troops on the ground and air support. But isn't one important lesson from the last years that military solutions generally solve little? Russia's invasion of Afghanistan three and a half decades ago turned into a fiasco. The U.S. and its allies didn't do much better. Their operation in Afghanistan has cost thousands of lives and over $900 billion so far. The security situation there remains unstable, and the Taliban are once again growing strong. Other operations in Iraq and Libya have left behind scorched earth and unstable governments. Their territories are providing a breeding ground for terrorist movements. Would an intervention in Syria prove just as disastrous? Give us an answer, Ines. Well, we have to be precisely when it comes to an intervention. I think, yes, indeed, it would be a disaster if we would pe uh, put uh, boots on the ground, as one says. Uh, but I think what we need to establish are really no-fly zones. So the refugees and the Syrians who are afraid of their lives have places where they just can find a little bit of peace. This is what one has to do, and this is the resp responsibility also of the West. Alan, your short take on that big question. I agree. Um, I, I, I don't think interventions are generally speaking bad. I would also contest the fact, I think that in Iraq, for instance, it's a better place since Saddam Hussein isn't there, whatever has happened since then. And I think we definitely need to be, have a stronger military presence in, in Syria. I would go further. I, th I think Western boots on the ground are necessary since we have Russian boots on the ground. With one, one million people died in Iraq, and uh, let me quote Putin, everything that US uh, puts their hands on turns out a Libya or an Iraq. Why Putin is intervening now? Why, uh, after a year, we have an imminent problem with the IS. After a year and 10,000 air, airstrikes by the US Air Force, IS uh, is on the offense. They are multiplying themselves. And uh, he sees exactly that, that, that the US and the West bombs only very selectively, only to protect their assets in Iraq and elsewhere, but they let the IS fighters through when they don't see it opportunistic to bomb them. That's why he feels that urge to intervene and to stop, to curb this, this spread of IS, which is very imminently uh, dangerous for, for the Russian what, interests what, also. What, what about the ordinary Russian people? Do they get their say in this? Do they not have the kind of... Every time America goes into a military operation abroad, people start saying, Vietnam, Vietnam. It's a trauma. The Russians have a trauma from Afghanistan. Is that expressed in any way? Uh, Are there, there no qualms there around is, that? Uh, of, of course, you, you cannot put on the same level or, or, or on the same scale the um, invasion in Afghanistan and uh, um, the possible uh, Russian engagement in Syria. But it was traumatic Syria, for the Russian which, people. Which Do they not, think about it which when is not Vladimir place Putin yet. talks about sending more troops into Syria? Syria is, is very different, of course, in scale, in numbers, in uh, uh, everything. So it's, it's quite incorrect 
to directly compare it with Afghanistan. And, uh, well, uh, well, if you will, oh with Putin's... I'm hearing the music, I'm hearing the music. Vladimir Putin is centre stage once again in the Syrian story. Is he a man of war or a man of peace? Man of war. A man of he war or a man of peace? He can be a man who helps bring at least a little bit of peace. A man of peace? Three different opinions. I hope you've uh, had plenty of food for thought from our discussion today. Thank you for uh, all for coming <laughs> along. I wish we had just a little bit more time. Uh, if you want to get your opinion to us, get in touch on Twitter or Facebook or just send an email. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Come back next week. Bye-bye.